Oftentimes, when I'm trying to come up with an idea for a weekly YouTube video, I start with one very specific little problem. But then as I'm building the example files, my creativity kicks in, and before I know it, I've turned it into a full-blown project. This week's video is one of those examples. Let's start with the initial problem. I'm using Power Query to go out and retrieve stat data based on a user's company selection. The user's given a list of these various companies, but the problem is the stock prices of these companies vary wildly. So if we start with something like UR Energy, the stock price varies somewhere between the $1 and $2.50 range. But if I were to choose something like Berkshire Hathaway, that stock price trades in the $700 to $800,000 range. And then we have other companies kind of in the middle, like Amazon, that trades in the $2 to $250 range. The problem with these wild sweeping prices is the y-axis. Many people, when they discuss charts, will often state that all charts should start at zero. That way you don't get a distorted perspective on the data. Well, that's all well and good when I'm working with UR Energy and my y-axis goes from zero to $2.50. But the moment I go to NVR and the price is between seven and $8,000, I lose all of the resolution and detail in that chart because my y-axis is covering too much area where no activity is occurring. Now, of course, one way to solve this problem, we can double-click on the y-axis and then go into the axis bounds and change this. So I could change my minimum to 7,000 and maybe my maximum to 8,500. And by doing so, I get much greater detail. So by not starting at zero, we are getting a slightly distorted perspective in terms of change. But anybody reading this chart is going to understand that this is an exaggerated view. It's a zoomed view. So they're not going to think, say, in November 4th, that the stock just completely crashed. Because no, it's not that wildly different from the beginning of the data to the end of the data. But now if I switch back to UR Energy, I see no information at all because my y-axis has been hard set to the $7 to $8,500 range. UR Energy trades in the $1 to $2 range. So I have to keep going back to this axis and then customizing these bounds. And now I've got the detail I'm looking for. What I want to do is have those access bounds, the minimum and maximum, to recalculate based on the data. If only I could write something like a min function that would find the smallest low value and a max function that would find the largest high value. Because if I could get those answers inside of a cell, then maybe I could use a cell reference for the minimum and maximum bounds. The problem is you can't use cell references in these chart customization options. What I could do, however, is use VBA and a macro to reprogram those options. This is where the project starts to expand with possibility. Even though we're only trying to figure out a way to create a dynamic access bound, let's take the opportunity to learn a whole suite of other features in Excel and use them in combination. We're going to use data tables to store our company names and their stock ticker symbols. We'll use data validation dropdowns to provide those lists of companies to the user. And then based on the user's selection, we'll turn that company name into a stock ticker symbol using an XLOOKUP function. That discovered stock ticker symbol will then be used by Power Query as a parameter to retrieve the last 30 days of stock information for that company. We'll use a min and a max function to find the lowest and highest sale value over the entire 30-day period. We'll use a let function to simplify a formula that uses ceiling and floor functions to calculate the proper access bounds based on those max min results. And all of this is going to be driven automatically using an event-driven macro. So the moment the user chooses a company from the data validation dropdown list, this entire process happens automatically. Here's a preview of the finished project behavior. I have a very low dollar value stock, but now I'll select a mid-level stock and my axis has changed. If I choose something a little higher, again, the axis has automatically changed. Something mid-level like Google, and now we're into the hundreds range. And then a really extreme like Berkshire Hathaway, and we're in the hundreds of thousands. But all of that scaling is adjusting automatically. Now, if you're unfamiliar with a stock chart and how to interpret this, I've also included a sweet little VBA trick where we can have a button here that shows a miniature legend. And when the user clicks that miniature legend, it pops up with a larger legend. And then they can click the larger legend or the button itself and make that go away if they don't want to see it. 
Be sure to download these files from the link in the video description so you can have access to all of the formulas, plus all of the VBA code fully documented. Small parts of this will have to be adjusted to suit your particular situation, but I've tried to include as much documentation in here to make this as easy as possible if you're not familiar with VBA. And the changes are very minimal and obvious. We'll begin by just figuring out what code is needed to change the upper and lower bounds of the y-axis. We'll double-click on the y-axis in the chart, and that will open up the configuration area for that element. It is here under Axis Options where we're going to alter the minimum and maximum bounds. Because we don't know what the code is, we'll get the system to tell us. We'll do this by going up to View, and in the upper right corner, Macros, and we're going to record a macro. The name of the macro is irrelevant because we're not going to keep it. We just want to see what code is generated. And I want to make sure I put it in this workbook if that's not selected. We'll click OK. And all we have to do is just change these values one time. So I'll change a minimum to $1. And I'll change maximum to $2.40. Back on the View ribbon, we'll hit the lower part of the Macros button and choose Stop Recording. Now to see that code, we'll go back up to the Macros button, choose View Macros, and then find that Macro 1 Macro. I have a lot of other macros on my system, but yours will likely only have this one. We don't want to run it, we're going to edit it. This will take us into the VBA editor, and we can see the VBA code that was generated when we changed the minimum and maximum values. So it is these two lines of code that we need to use. What I've done is created a macro that does much more than just reprogramming those two options. I've included this code in a text file so you can copy paste it into this module. This is what's known as an event-driven macro. Normally macros are executed when you launch them. An event-driven macro launches automatically. So back in our spreadsheet, this user selection dropdown is located in cell C2. In the code, we're checking C2 for change. Anytime something changes in that cell, we want to execute all of this code. Now don't concern yourself with what all this code means. Most of it you won't have to change. But if we scroll down, here are those two lines that we saw a moment ago when we auto-recorded. This code contains error checking. In case the user deletes the chart, it won't crash the system. What you would need to change in your case is the name of the chart and the name of the sheet that that chart exists on. If you're going to use Power Query to retrieve this stock data, you'll also need to change this to the name of the query that's responsible for that data collection. Notice I also have a reference to something called min sale and max sale. We'll see what those are for in just a moment. I have another sheet called Calcs. The Calcs sheet contains a proper data table called Companies. It's from this table that data validation is providing this list of user-friendly drop-down names. So if we go back to the dynamic access test and go to cell C2, data, data validation, this cell is looking at the calcs sheet of company names in column B. And so we get this list. That company's table's first column is the stock ticker for that company. In cell D3, I'm using an XLOOKUP function to take the user's choice from cell C2 of that other sheet, find it in the company name column of this company's table, and return the ticker symbol from the same table. This cell is named ticker input. That is going to be used as a parameter in Power Query. To see the query, on the Data tab, we'll go to Queries and Connections, and here I have a query called Get Last 30 Days. Looking back at the VBA code, here is where I'm referencing that get last 30 days query. This instruction will refresh the query. We'll right click on that query, choose edit. In Power Query, to retrieve stock data from the user selected company, the first step in this query will retrieve the result of the XLOOKUP function in the cell we named ticker input. In this case, the stock ticker symbol for Berkshire Hathaway. We will then use that in this particular URL. Notice in the black, we're concatenating the result from the prior step, which is the stock ticker symbol, to this website URL. When executed, that will retrieve all of the stock information for that company, in this case, all the way back to 1980. We'll promote the first row to a header row, set the data types, but we only want the last 30 days. So the last step just filters and keeps the last 30 days.
whenever the user selects a new company, we need to refresh that query and go get the last 30 days of stock information. Back on the calcs sheet, one of the things I'm doing is calculating the average stock volume, and I'm just using an average function to do that. But I want to concatenate that to some text. This will act as a title, so the average stock volume, and then display this result. The problem is the average function displays an unformatted value, so I have to wrap that in a text function and give it these format codes to turn that into something a little more appealing. And so we end up with this. That cell will drive a text box that I've laid on top of this chart. So General Electric, the average stock volume is 3.6 million. But if I were to change this to Berkshire Hathaway, that average stock volume is only 354. Apple, 47 million. In cell J4, I'm using a min function to find the lowest number in the low column of that query output. So that query was called get last 30 days. This table is called last 30 days. So I'm getting the lowest value from the low column. In N4, I'm using a max function to get the largest value from the high column. So back here, largest value from high. Once I've determined the lowest low and the highest high, I then want to calculate the spread between those two points. What's the highest high minus the lowest low? This is going to help me determine the range at which I need to zoom in on that y-axis. In cell K4, this is where I've calculated where the low bound of that axis needs to be, which needs to be just slightly below the lowest low value. So if the lowest low value is 244, I want my axis to start at 240. Likewise for my high value, in cell O4, I've calculated a value that is just slightly larger than my largest high value. My largest high is 277. I want my axis to stop at 280. These are the two formulas that I'm using to calculate those axis adjustments. So if I click on the axis adjustment for the low, expanding my formula bar, here's the formula. Because I'll need to calculate the spread between the high and the low, and I need to do this possibly multiple times, I've decided to use a let function so I can perform this calculation once and store it in a variable called calc. I will then use a floor function to derive a value slightly lower than that calculated difference. J4 holds that low value, so the floor.math function says let's take that particular value and lower it by what amount. In this case, the distance I lower it depends on the value of that calculated spread. I'm using a switch function to ask a series of questions about that spread and based on the result, lower it by a certain factor. So the switch function says, I'm going to assume something in here is true. And the first thing I'm going to check is if that spread stored in the calc variable is less than one. If it is, then set the value of J4 to the closest 50 cent mark below J4's value. If the spread is less than 10, but greater than one, then lower the value of J4 to the closest dollar. If the spread calculation is less than 100, but over 10, then lower the value of J4 to the closest $10 value. And then anything else will just consider a hit or a true, lower it to the closest $100 value. So we have a switch function wrapped inside a floor.math function, all wrapped up neatly inside of a let function. Notice in the name box, I've named cell K4 min sale. Back in the VBA code, it is this line that is responsible for retrieving the value in the cell named min sale on the calcs sheet. In cell 04, we're doing the same thing, but we're just doing it with a ceiling function instead of a floor function. This rounds in an upward direction instead of a downward direction, but the logic is the same. That cell is named max sale, and we can see in the VBA code, it is this line of code that's responsible for capturing the value in the cell named max sale on the calcs worksheet. Now the final piece to the puzzle. How do we get all of that VBA code to change the moment the user selects a different company from the company dropdown? This is going to be done utilizing what's known as an event-driven macro. If you hold down the Alt key and press the F11 key, this will open up the Visual Basic Editor. If you were not already placed on the code sheet for that DynAxis test sheet, then in the Project Explorer, double-click this entry. This is where we want to copy all that code from the text file. The key to all of this lies in this line of code. 
This is an event-driven instruction known as worksheet underscore change, which means anytime anything changes on the sheet, it's going to perform some type of examination. For us, when it detects change, it will examine the state of cell C2. If nothing changed in C2, the macro is ended and nothing occurs. But if it does detect a change in cell C2, then it will proceed to execute the remainder of this code. With this code in place, back on our dashboard, we go to cell C2, the company list, pick something from the list, and all of that code is executed. Pick something different from the list, all new results. So to recap the process, on the calc sheet, we have a proper data table with company names and ticker symbols. The company names are used as a data validation on the dashboard. The user selects a name from the dashboard. An XLOOKUP function will then look up that name in this table and return the ticker symbol. That ticker symbol will be sent into Power Query as a parameter to return the last 30 days of stock information. Using the high and the low columns of that stock information, we'll find the lowest low and the highest high. Use our let functions to calculate slightly lower than the lowest low and slightly higher than the highest high. For our report, we'll also take the average of the volume column of that stock ticker data, concatenate that to some text, and use a text function to format it. That then just becomes a reference in a text box. By the way, I have another text box here that just referenced the ticker input named range, which is cell D3 on our calcs sheet. And that way I can always show the ticker symbol. I've also created a dynamic heading in my chart by having that heading object reference cell C2 on this sheet, which is the user's selection. So there you have it. A project that originally was only supposed to be about automatically changing the y-axis in a chart, but ended up becoming something much more versatile. Make sure you download these files from the link in the video description so you can have access to all of the code, all of the documentation. And even though you may never build this particular type of stock reporting service, there are plenty of other tricks in this project that you'd be able to use in a variety of other situations. So as always, let me know what you think in the comments. What was your favorite feature? And can you think of any ways to improve this? I'm always looking for suggestions and ideas for making things better. Thanks so much for watching, and remember at BCTI, the learning never stops.